Put your hands up. Drop that jacket. When the two plainclothes police officers switched the lights on in the Watergate building, who should they find hiding there? Frank Sturgis and Bernard Barker, who were working for E. Howard Hunt, exactly the same people who had murdered President Kennedy nine years earlier. Sturgis even told the San Francisco Chronicle that the true reason for the burglary of the Watergate offices was to retrieve compromising pictures of CIA men in Dealey Plaza, which Bush. the Democrats were going to have published. Bush did it. Of course, somebody had to take a fall for conducting such a woefully sloppy operation. And when Howard Hunt found himself in prison for 33 months, he rather turned against his old friends for making him into the patsy on this occasion. He began sending messages to President Richard Nixon that he might just tell all he knew about what really happened in Dallas on November 22, 1963. And one of Nixon's presidential aides, Dean Birch, recalls that when he heard about this, George Bush broke out all over in assholes and shit himself to death. It was this situation which led directly to what journalists now refer to as the Watergate murder, the crash of Flight 553. On December the 8th, 1972, Dorothy Wetzel Hunt, the wife of E. Howard Hunt, boarded a flight from Washington to Chicago. A CIA agent, like her husband, she carried a quarter of a million dollars in her bag, which was to buy the silence of his Watergate co-conspirators. Travelling along with Dorothy was CBS news correspondent Michelle Clark, whose CIA boyfriend had been able to give her a unique journalistic insight into what Watergate was really all about. These two women boarded the aircraft with a dozen other individuals who at that time had information which E. Howard Hunt claimed was going to blow the White House out of the water. As the plane made its final approach through fog and very low cloud, the people living near the aircraft runway sensed something rather strange was going on. The normally quiet suburban street suddenly filled up with cars. And a moment later, having been told to power down too early, Flight 553 emerged from the mist and clipped the branches of some trees before crashing on top of several bungalows on West 70 70 Street. The watching neighbors were then staggered to see FBI agents immediately leap out of their cars and start rooting around in the debris, a full 10 minutes before the fire brigade even arrived on the scene. 44 people, including Dorothy Hunt and Michelle Clark, were killed in the crash. E. Howard Hunt served his time and came out of prison a widower and a million dollars richer. Hmm. Nice. The Nazi shallow government of the United States had faced a blackmail threat and the possibility that their complicity in the murder of President Kennedy might become public knowledge. Their response was to bring down a civilian airliner onto a residential district. They covered it up by having FBI agents on the ground seek out and remove all incriminating documents from the dead bodies found in the wreckage. And when the local TV station received an anonymous phone call from a radio hound who had monitored the deliberately misleading exchanges from the Midway Control Tower, which caused 553 to crash, an FBI agent simply confiscated all the tapes, thus eradicating all information pertaining to the accident. This is how the agents of the US government now behave. They function essentially as a goon squad of mercenaries and murderers, hardly any different to Hitler's Gestapo, and are used as a private intelligence service and as personal hit men for America's richest families. Their only role being to cover up the dirty tricks which the rich people are playing on their fellow countrymen every day. Along with threats and murder, <sighs> the most important weapon used by this private army of footpads in this ongoing cover-up is disinformation. And it's here that we can now address a question which will probably be bothering the huge numbers of people who have taken an interest in the Kennedy assassination and in the many documentaries produced by assassination researchers over the years. What happened to Badge Man? The answer is very simple. He never existed. He was simply a phantom, created by the CIA's disinformation machine to lay down a trail which led nowhere. So now another question appears. If this is so, why have so many people spent a quarter of a century trying to discover his identity?